did you kill her? No, sir. Fight ensued, blood is spilled. Right. Where did she hit you? So let's talk about some of the suspicious behavior that you want to respond to. Hey, Dr. Phil here. If you're smart, you will subscribe to the behavior panel. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, Body Language Tactics, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military, published the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, body language, persuasion, and influence. And now I train intelligence agencies and the general public in the same. Greg? Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Put together this bodylanguagetactics.com course with Scott Rouse and spend most of my time on Wall Street or corporate America. Dr. Phil? Well, I'm Dr. Phil, and I am a huge fan of these four guys, so I'm Zoom bombing this whole thing so I can come in here and hang out with these guys and hopefully get some credibility and learn something, which I do every time I watch them, uh, which is quite often. Uh, so they are letting me show up today and uh, listen and learn and talk, so here I am. I'm one of the, one of the boys today. Brilliant. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, so good. Thanks, Thanks for coming Thanks so in. Much. Yeah, yeah. So today we're going to talk about a guy named Mark Castellano, Castellano and uh, he's uh, convicted. I don't know if he's convicted yet, but I know he's accused of killing his his uh, girlfriend. And Dr. Phil, you, it's your videos. So why don't you tell us, give us a little background on it? Uh, this was a really interesting case. We do a lot of um, we do a lot of current crime cases, and this one was particularly interesting because this man was living with his girlfriend in Houston. And uh, really a mismatch. This guy was an IT guy, a real kind of nerd. And she was kind of an it girl, really popular, vivacious, outgoing, uh, worked in a law firm uh, as a paralegal, had a lot of friends. Uh, and all of a sudden she goes missing. And so they start investigating because it looked fishy from the beginning. And Harris County law enforcement was uh, investigating this case. And it was in the news. And my news producers got onto it and started talking to him. And he talked to Harris County law enforcement, I believe it was the sheriff's department at the time, and said, I'm thinking about interviewing with Dr. Phil uh, because I want to turn a bright light on over this whole thing to help try and find her. What do you guys think? And they said, oh, hell yes. We absolutely think you should go interview with Dr. Phil. I have a very active relationship with Harris County Law Enforcement, and they knew I would ask hard questions, and they said, "You absolutely. We think you should do that for sure. And at, and that's what happened. He He was in Odessa at the time, and so I went into Odessa and interviewed him at his parents' home um, and sat down with him and started just asking him to tell me his side of the story. And I found him to be very peculiar from the beginning. I found the facts of the case to be very peculiar from the beginning and found him and his, his demeanor and characteristics to be very interesting um, with a lot of red flags from the very beginning. Interesting. Nice. Okay, great, great. All right, are you guys ready to look at the first video? Yeah, yeah let's have a look. Here we go. Let's talk about the night she disappeared. Okay. You had a fight. Yes, sir. And was this a physical fight or an argument or both? Basically, I come home, um, she's in her room. The first thing she does is start yelling at me that the Caden has made a big mess. He was running wild. Uh, about this point, I start arguing. You know, you've been asleep. You know, what do you want? You take enough Xanax so you can't hear him. You know, and we start fighting. Caden is at this point in his room, hiding. She walks up to me and she gives me this kind of sucker punch while I'm on the floor. I mean, it 
she, she hits me all the time and I don't retaliate, but she hit me and said, and clean it up right, expletive, expletive, and she goes in and slams the door. Where did she hit you? She in the face. She in the face? Yeah. And you didn't retaliate? No. All right, Greg, what do you got? So he starts off, we're going to see this guy's baseline. We always talk about someone looking down this way, looking down that way. The baseline I see this guy do throughout this whole thing is one of somebody who's arrogant around his friends. Head back when he's talking. Maybe it's just for you, Dr. Phil, I don't know. But what I see is a guy who's probably the smartest guy he knows who's looking down his nose when he's talking to someone. And as he's looking down, that, that chin up means later when his chin drops and we see him going into pre-confession, it won't be as pronounced as we see a normal person do. It will be a little less. So we'll look at that. He does a couple of things that are interesting. When you start asking him questions, I watch his eyes drift down to his left, a little internal conversation, figuring out how he should approach it. And then I'm going to leave a lot of stuff here because there's a lot of us and we want to talk. There's a smirk at she hits me. I love the fact that he says my face. And then you ask when you ask the question, did you go, did you hit her back? And he goes, no, no, sir. There's a lilt there at the end. So there's odd body language here. He uses the word basically, which we don't see over and over and over. And at yeah, he does what Scott calls fading facts. His tone kind of drifts off. So listen to all those, look for the baseline here. And this is his first thing. The other thing is he's overly helpful, which I always find interesting. And it's going to trip him up later when Doc starts putting pressure on him. So from there, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, completely concur on the basically there. That kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, this one really hits me as well. Kind of sucker punch. She gives me this kind of sucker punch. Well, well was it a sucker punch or was it kind of a sucker punch? Like, what is it? What is it? Which one is it? So I'm, I'm worried about, about that. I'm really interested by this psh, psh, that happens. So, so what is that about? Because it kind of sounds like the noise that Ewan McGregor used to make when he was filming um, uh, Star Wars and he, he, they, he, they hadn't got real set lightsabers or, or the, and, and he would make the sounds <laughs> as well to kind of get into the fantasy. So is it that kind of fantasy sound where he's, he's imagining the hit on the face and he's making the hit on the face sound because it didn't actually happen? Or is it an expletive, an explosive of air because that question he wasn't expecting? I think it's either, here's my fantasy sound to make, to make this real for me, or damn, I wasn't expecting that one. I'm gonna make something up right now. I'm really interested by how calm he is at the moment. Feels really calm to me, but that slight side up smile happening there. That's kind of odd. But right off the bat, pretty calm, pretty calm at the moment. Let's see where where uh, Dr. Phil can take him. But Chase, what do you got? Yep, uh, agree with both of you guys. And one thing we're seeing here is the immediate selling. We're, give, we're being sold a story about one person who's a bad person. And everything you're going to hear here in the future is going to be about him and how he did the right thing. He is a good person. He's helping the police. He's doing all this stuff. And everything else is going to be about the other person uh, using drugs or doing something bad or needing help or needing some kind of help. So I think we're seeing we're starting to see a little pattern here of this narcissistic behavior, which goes back to what Greg was talking about with this chin up motion. And when primates, humans included, our closest relatives are, are bonobo chimps. When we want to show that we're not scared of an enemy or we want to challenge another enemy, you've all seen this in a bar fight before. The chin goes up, the arms go out. When someone's about to fight, we expose vital organs. When we are confident and we're showing that we're not afraid of what's going on. And I think we're seeing the shell of someone who honestly believes that they're going to pull the wool over Dr. Phil's eyes. And we're seeing somebody who views Dr. Phil as a TV show host, not a 40 year career forensic psychologist and, and like trial consultant. So we're seeing that. And I think when, when, when Dr. Phil asked him about where did she hit you? Where did she hit you? In the, in the face. Yeah. It's a wonderful question because it gave him that opportunity. He had to pause. His eyes went down for internal dialogue, and he had to maybe rehearse this in his head. Truthful people don't have to do that. Scott, I'll pass it to you. 
All right. I think the most beautiful thing about this, if there's anything beautiful about it, is he has no earthly ID. He's being interrogated. He has no clues at his parents' house. He's, he thinks he's in charge, thinks he's in control. He's got it all under control, and he has no earthly idea what's going on. He thinks he does, but in reality, he has he's no clue. Doesn't know what's happening to him. That's I think that's awesome the way you, the way you pull that off, Doctor Phil. It's unbelievable. And what what happens here is he starts uh, like you were saying, Chase. He creates the enemy here. He has to have the story of it's me and I'm the good guy and this person's the bad person. And here's all the things she did. She's she's violent to me. She neglects her child. She takes drugs. The first thing she does is start yelling at me that the Caden has made a big mess. He was running wild. Uh, about this point, I start arguing. You know, you've been asleep. You know, what do you want? You take enough Xanax so you can't hear him, you know. As he creates the enemy or the monster, he set himself up to be the good guy when he says he doesn't didn't fight her back or he didn't retaliate. Where did she hit you? In the face. In the face? Yeah. And you didn't retaliate? No. Really? And as he goes through, he's, and he's thinking about what he's saying, he's got pretty much the idea of what he's going to say. He's got, he, he knows what he's going to say, the idea of it, but he hasn't said it out loud. So as he's looking around down here, he's running that story in his head. He's got the structure down, but he really doesn't have it pieced together or linked together well. That's why we see him looking around and thinking, and we see that one little thing, one little shot of contempt as he goes through that. It's not a micro expression. It's this really fast expression of contempt. This thread runs throughout here. This whole thing where he creates an enemy, creates a monster, runs throughout the entire series of videos as we go through here, as he attempts to do that, which makes sense for someone who has done something they shouldn't have done. And they've got to have a reason why, if you think, if I get caught doing this, I've got to have a reason why I did it. Otherwise, why would he be talking about all that? Why would he be setting himself up for this is really common uh, when you, when you see someone in this situation, when they've been accused of something like this and they're trying to defend themselves and they're defending themselves for later on as well. So that's what I see happening here. Dr. Phil, what do you got? Well, I, I'll say this. I I, uh, I I would hate to try to lie to you four guys. It would be like trying to smuggle sunrise by a rooster. Uh, it would just be terrible because you're picking up so many different things, and the body just can't lie. There are so many different signals that you can't control them all, right? I mean, you can you control your words, but you can't control all of your physiological signals, and you're picking up on, on so many of them, and I agree with every one of them. I can tell you my approach in talking with him and anyone that I'm going to try to uh, you know, there's two different, I break things into two categories. One is deception detection. That's one thing. Can you tell if somebody's lying to you? And then secondly is then what is the truth? You can, you, you, you try to determine if they're being deceptive, but then you also say, okay, if that's a lie, then what is the truth? And uh, as I think it was Cardinal, Cardinal Richelieu who said, give me nine lines of dialogue, I can hang any man. I usually go in and, and just, let them believe that I'm buying everything they're saying going in. Just like I'm going for this hook, line, and sinker because they'll just keep talking and talking and talking. And I was immediately struck by two things. One is that what he was saying was so rehearsed and so inappropriate. Think about this. All, all of, all of y'all that are listening and, and watching at home, think about if somebody you loved someone, the mother of your child, had truly gone missing, what your state of mind would be. It would be, oh, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm desperate to find her no matter what in the world else. I'm desperate to find her. His priority was to assassinate her character. The first thing she does is start yelling at me that the Caden has made a big mess. He was running wild. Uh, about this point, I start arguing, you know, you've been asleep, you know, what do you want? You take enough Xanax so you can't hear him. She hit me. She attacked me. She walks up to me and she gives me this kind of sucker punch while I'm on the floor. I mean, it, she, she hits me all the time. She was involved with all of these, these shady things. His number one goal was to make sure I knew she was a bad person. I knew she attacked him. He wasn't interested in trying to find her. He was interested in me knowing she was a bad person. The minute I heard all of that, I thought, okay, th this is, th something is seriously, seriously wrong here. And the fact that it was so rehearsed, 
if you're having a confrontation like he's talking about psychologically, those things are chaotic. He talked about it like a waiter reciting the specials. I, I, first she here, then she came here, then she hit me there, then she went here. Da, 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 da. She, she hits me all the time and I don't retaliate, but she hit me and said, and clean it up right, expletive, expletive. I, I think if I'd have interrupted him in the middle, he'd have had to go back to the beginning to tell the story. I thought he was very rehearsed. I thought it was very inappropriate. And I, I think he just was not reading the room, but I was encouraging him along. And as you say, surely you would think if you have the stakes are so high, he would have looked up on the internet, gone to YouTube, where I've had billions of views and made a determination that this guy is going to ask some follow-up questions. This isn't mm -hmm. just going to be, I'm going to go down there. You know, your story goes a whole lot better if you're the only one telling it. But if you get asked some follow-up questions, you need to have some answers in mind. I don't think he expected at all that this was going to turn into an interrogation. And he was just throwing out things without any thought whatsoever about, am I going to have to make good on this statement? Uh, so he ca he wrote some checks he couldn't cash in the first 30 seconds, first 45 seconds of this conversation. And I made note of those. I thought he was arrogant. I thought he was narcissistic. And I thought he was interested in assassinating her character, all of which is psychologically incongruent with where he should be at that point in the story. Let's talk about the night she disappeared. Okay. You had a fight. Yes, sir. And was this a physical fight or an argument or both? Basically, I come home. Um, she's in her room. The first thing she does is start yelling at me that the Caden has made a big mess. He was running wild. Uh, about this point, I start arguing. You know, you've been asleep. You know, what do you want? You take enough Xanax so you can't hear him. You know, when we start fighting. Caden is at this point in his room hiding. She walks up to me and she gives me this kind of sucker punch while I'm on the floor. I mean, it, she, she hits me all the time and I don't retaliate. But she hit me and said, and clean it up right, expletive, expletive. And she goes in and slams the door. Where did she hit you? She hit, she hit you in the face? Yeah. And you didn't retaliate? No. All right. We good? Yeah. Yep. OK, so you say she goes in, slams the door. You think she's just in there right. on the bed or something. But you go back in to resume the argument, right. frankly. Yes. And she's gone. She's gone. Yes, sir. And that's last time you saw her was when she punched you in the face. Yes, sir. When I'm sitting there watching her walk away, slam that door, and that's the last time. She has a car. She didn't take the car. So why didn't she take the car? You know, I don't really know uh, for certain. She's always carrying narcotics, and she's definitely, definitely afraid of being pulled over by the police. All right, Chase, what do you got? We start right away. We talk a lot about tense. Are they speaking in present tense, past tense, or past perfect, which is probably going to come up a little bit later. He starts off with, she is gone. But that was due to Dr. Phil's questioning, because Dr. Phil led him into a present tense mindset that's often very helpful for people to recall memories. So instead of saying, tell me what happened after you left the living room. So we would ask the question by, all right, you leave the living room, now what's happening? So we're kind of pushing the person into a more present tense mindset. I think that's why we're seeing like she is gone instead of she was gone. And she's gone. She's gone. Yes, sir. And I think this video shows Duper's delight. When he's saying she slams the door, you can see him almost sneering or smiling at his own deception there. And when he's saying she didn't take the car, there's a lemon sucking on a lemon sour pucker there. And I think that he regrets not getting rid of that car. She has a car. She didn't take the car. So what? To, as of now, video one and video two that you've looked at, you have not heard him mention a name yet. So when a suspect fails to mention the name of a victim, but they are willing to mention names of other involvees, like the son or the mother or uh, involved family members, this is a big red flag. And I want to just make a distinction here. Oh, 
there are very, very few women on planet Earth who would walk away from their child without even sending a text or checking in over an email or calling a family member. Uh, but a woman who would leave her child and not ever come back would prioritize her car and phone. And a woman who would prioritize her child wouldn't care about her car or phone. Uh, so we see a, a, a big uh, difference here and that there's one in a billion women maybe that would just abandon their child and never contact them or even just check in to see how their kids are doing. So Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I think that's, that's really astute. Uh, look, calm, confident, <laughs> that, that side of the mouth up. Like, like somebody who doesn't realize they're on the Dr. Phil show right now. It's like, have you not, have you not worked this out? Have you not, have you not looked into what could happen on this show? He really feels like he's got this one, which is amazing to see. Here's my, I've just got one point on this because here's my biggest issue with it. And, and correct me if I've got this wrong somewhere. He says, I was in there watching her. Well, I was in there watching her walk away, slam the door, and that's the last time. That's the last time you saw her was when she punched you in the face. Yes, sir. I was in there watching her walk away, slam that door, and that's the last time. Hang on then. So you were in there watching her walk away. You were in there watching her walk away, slam the door, but you're still in there. You're not outside the room. You're still in the room. Like, you've got to get the geography right. In my mind, he's now accidentally told us the story whereby he's in a room with her. He or she has slammed the door. They're in the same room. He never comes back to open the door to go, hey, where, 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 where's she gone? He's in the room with her all the time. Now, you know, put in the comments there if, if you, or, or tell me guys if you think I've got that, that wrong, but I think he's just described the geography of being in the room with her all the time, I think. But Scott, what do you got? Give me your thoughts. All right. Um, I, think the, I think the mouth situation going on there is lip pursing. When your lips are pursed, that usually denotes or suggests and indicates that you don't agree with what's happening there. And in his case, it could be, and sometimes if your lips are pursed and they, go a little bit to the side that suggests that you might see a different outcome to what's being talked about. And in this case, I think what we're seeing is a combination of those two things because this thing progresses onto a bigger mouth movement. I really, really got into this part of it because I'd seen a couple others as we went along and this thing grows and gets more intense as the interrogation gets more intense for him. He's, he has an issue here. In other words, there's something here for him and that's, that's where you see it and you start going in deeper at that point. And then Dr. Phil says, well, why didn't she take the car? He says, I really don't know for certain. So why didn't she take the car? You know, I don't really know uh, for certain. Well, he knows why, because he killed her. So he knows for certain why, but he's just saying, I don't know for certain, but he does know. When you hear those things, I, I, I know, but I don't know for certain. You know, I don't really know uh, for certain. That's what that's saying. So I, I don't really know for certain. You can't say that's what it means every time, but when you start piling these things up, a little pile, that's what starts suggesting someone is either innocent or they're guilty or they're, they're being deceptive with you. That's really deceptive. A little red flag there for that. Um, again, that arrogant smile, he's got that all cocked back in that head. This is a really arrogant guy. I don't think he's a psychopath. I don't think he's a sociopath. I think we're dealing with someone, and I, he may not be a malignant narcissist. I don't, I don't know about that, but I know for sure I haven't talked to him, though I know for sure he's a narcissist from what he's saying and to the emotions we're not seeing here. No empathy for this for this girl. No empathy for this child. No empathy for for anyone, even for himself. I don't think, because we see no expressions, facial expressions at all, that show us any emotion whatsoever, other than happiness, or joy. So, Doctor Phil, what do you got? Well, here's what I'm thinking at the time. This is a very intelligent guy, just in terms of just raw intellect. This this guy's probably 95th percentile. He works in the IT field, and he has a sophisticated job within the IT field. I mean, he's not plugging in computers. This guy is doing sophisticated work. Now, so that means he can think in complex ways. Now, if you've watched Law & Order, 
you know that if somebody disappears without their car, without their keys, and there is no activity on their cell phone for a week, that's bad. <laughs> okay, so he's coming to talk to somebody, and her car is there, her keys are there, and her phone is there, and there's not been any activity on it whatsoever. You're going to think, they're going to think that's suspicious. I need to have some kind of explanation for that. But he is, this is where the narcissism comes in, is he doesn't think that that he has to explain that. He just thinks, I, you know, I, I, don't know. I don't know. She just, she's in the bedroom one minute, and I've never seen her since. I'm sitting there watching her walk away, slam that door, and that's the last time. But let me tell you, she's afraid the police will pull her over with the car, so that's probably why she wasn't in it. She has a car. She didn't take the car. So why didn't she take the car? You know, I don't really know uh, for certain. She's always carrying narcotics, and she's definitely, definitely afraid of being pulled over by the police. Again, I want to come back to telling you, Dr. Phil, what a bad human being this is. She hit me. She does drugs. She's afraid of the police. She disappeared on me. Uh, not the first time, by the way. Uh, so again, it, it, this is not reading the room, not reading the situation. So it's, it tells me that I'm dealing with an extreme narcissist. And you, know, you said you were there. What, did, what was the feeling in the room? At this point, he's still in control. He thinks he's, he hasn't read the room yet. The wheels haven't started to come off yet. And he really believes that he's, he's selling all of this and it's going along. And at this point, her name's Michelle Warner, and he always felt inadequate and inferior to her. And at this point, it is duping delight. It's like, okay, bitch, I got my who's who's the who's the top dog now? Because he knows what he's done, and now he's on TV. He's the one in the spotlight, and he knows where she is because he put her there, and he cannot help himself. Now he's in the catbird seat and it's coming through. It is duping delight and he can't help himself. And he hasn't started to read the room yet, but he's getting ready to. Yeah. You Things know, are getting ready to take a seriously bad turn for him. My dad didn't know a thing about body language, but he would say you like a jackass eating briars when you think you're that yeah. guy. And yeah. that's on my list. The first thing I see in him is that, that, that smile, those teeth. Um, it, he eye blocks. And what we're going to see later is that is his number one indicator he's lying because he eye blocks when, he's, when he makes up something just out of plain cloth. I saw a stancer, what Scott and I call a stancer, taking high ground, pulling in all that, hey, she's a scumbag and I'm a good person. And um, one of the things I liked about watching him is he uses you to validate his points. Every time you say a word that anchors his story, boom, he's on it. And he's very respectful and yes, sir. And she's gone. She's gone. Yes, sir. Until you trip him up later and then he starts running all over you. I love that part. Um, at this point when he does the, see what I got? I have a plan when you ask me what about the car. She has a car. She didn't take the car. You see it, it just boils out of him. She has a car. She didn't take the car. And then his shift in eye access as he goes over there and that right shoulder coming up. When he wants request for approval, we always talk about requests for approval on here, Doc, where people raise their brow. Mm -hmm. He raises one, just one, that's good enough, every time he's asking for your approval. And when he thinks he's got it, I love the fact he's not figured out he's being interrogated yet. And right. we'll see later because when you get people out of thinking and into feeling, they start stammering and stuttering and they go into that kinesthetic left, right, down, left, right, down. You'll be able to see it coming. It's just right now he thinks he's in charge. I love, I love what you do with him there. Okay, so you say she goes in, slams the door. You think she's just in there right. on the bed or something. But you go back in to resume the argument, right. frankly. Yes. And she's gone. She's gone. Yes, sir. And that's last time you saw her was when she punched you in the face. Yes, sir. I'm she... sitting there watching her walk away, slam that door, and that's the last time. She has a car. She didn't take the car. So why didn't she take the car? You know, I don't really know uh, for certain. She's always carrying narcotics, and she's definitely, definitely afraid of being pulled over by the police. All right. Am I good? Yeah, good. Let's move. Did she 
just walk away from the apartment, you think? I'm sure someone picked her up. She doesn't walk anywhere. So you think she called somebody to come get her? She had to. Her cell phone has apparently not been on since she left. How would she communicate with people without her cell phone? The only thing is is she has a bag of cell phones, and that's what I told Houston police. Um, she probably had at least 11 of them. Really? Yes, sir. All right, uh, Dr. Phil, what do you got? Well, it, he's, he's so into selling that she's a bad person. And again, you, you have to, from a psychological standpoint, you have to continue to go back and put yourself in a position of where you would be if your significant other had gone missing and, and you were fearful that something terrible had happened to her. You, you have to put yourself in that position and say, okay, where would I be if I was in that position? What would my emotions be? What would my fears be? What would my, uh, what would my speculations and projections be? Um, and not one time has he shown any concern for her whatsoever. Um, and he said, well, she has so many cell phones, in fact, 11. The only thing is is she has a bag of cell phones. And that's what I told Houston police. Um, she probably had at least 11 of them. Really? 11 cell phones. Like he's counted her cell phones. Uh, she's shown him her collection of, so come here, let me show you my collection <laughs> of cell phones. Uh, he's just, he's, he's overreaching, he's overselling. And at, at this point, the absence of appropriate emotion and the overselling of the inappropriate emotion, if you assume something has bad, some, something bad has happened to her, the fact that you would be trashing someone that has something bad has befallen them is just so insensitive and so inappropriate. At this point, uh, my conclusion is he knows what has happened. So there's no mystery to him. There's no fear in him because he has the answers. He's the one person in the room that knows exactly what has happened. So um, it's the absence. I, I spend a lot of time hearing what isn't said. And at this point, I'm really listening to what isn't said. He's not saying her name. He's not talking about his concern for the child missing the mother. He's not, none of the things that you would expect a person to be talking about at this point is he's saying, and instead he's continuing the character assassination. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm just going to hit a couple of things here. One thing is I'm going to tell, show you later how I know he blocks his eyes or closes his eyes when he's lying. But one of the things you're going to notice here, first of all, he can't read body language at all because you're, you're looking at him with the most jaundiced eye I've ever seen when you're looking at him in the opening of that. And he can't figure that out, that you're on to him and that you're in, in there. Then if you listen to his tone change as he starts to talk about this phone, he's got filler words he uses, probably his argument style. How would she communicate with people without her cell phone? The only thing is that she has a bag of cell phones. The only thing is, the only thing is, the only thing is. The only thing is the cadence of that is very different from the other words. And then he <clears throat> does a little down left and goes to that 11 cell phones made up garbage that he's coming together with. So. At the end of that, he does a deep swallow, an eye lock, and a set jaw. Right there. That's all deception. That's all locking in on you, hoping that he's seeing that you believe him. And that's what I, what I see there. You, Scott. you say it's the most John Desai you've ever seen. Wait a few minutes. You're going oh, to see one. <laughs> I love when you get him in the well, when you get him down to where he's not oh, thinking anymore. Right? I was just waiting for him to say, I did it. I did it. Like Perry Mason, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, he's doing what I, he's got what I call vent mouth, especially there toward the end where he starts talking and he's talking like this. And that's what I told Houston police. And I call that vent mouth and that's short for ventriloquist mouth because it's like when you see a ventriloquist or when you go, we do it, guys do it. We're with our, our wives, we're out at a social engagement and we're in a group of people and somebody starts in that group, starts telling a story and we know it's not true. And you start like this, you look over to your wife and you go, are you listening to this? Are you kidding me? We all turn into ventriloquists. So that's vent mouth. He's not quite there, but he's getting there. And that's what I told Houston police. When he starts tightening up like that. He's adding a couple of qualifiers here that are red flags for me. When he says, uh, she doesn't walk anywhere. Did she 
just walk away from the apartment, you think? I'm sure someone picked her up. She doesn't walk anywhere. At the end, there's no need to put that in there, but he adds that in there to help help build that up. I'm sure someone picked her up. She doesn't walk anywhere. At this point, all of us would know this guy's full of it. Now, obviously, you did, Dr. Phil. But then he says, you, you said, uh, so she called somebody to come and get her, and he said she had to. So you think she called somebody to come get her? She had to. Really? Yeah, we, we, we don't need to know. You don't have to say she had to. You just say, yeah, you know. Again, no emotions in here are going are, are showing up that should be showing up with what's happening. Nothing at all. The only thing we're seeing in here, a little bit, just a, getting toward a touch of worry there with his vent mouth. At the, at the top where, you, where, Dr. Phil, you say, um, did she walk away from the apartment? His head nod should be a yes, but it's a no as he's saying yes. It's sort of, sort of this head bobble no thing. So it's, and that's where his qualifiers start. That's, I could go down the road for four weeks on that, but I won't. Chase, what do you got? Absolutely agree with you guys. And absolutely agree that there's a, there's a narrative and a story being sold to you. And he's not, he's not necessarily trying to sell Dr. Phil. He knows that this is going to go out somewhere. So he's carefully planned this, this thing in advance. I want you to watch at the very beginning of this video. When we, when we play it again, after this short discussion here, he shakes his head. No, no, for confirmation of Dr. Phil's question and no for negation of Dr. Phil's question. And this is one of those rare moments. I know people say you'll see a lot of body language experts that say, oh, he's saying, uh, no, I, I, I love my wife. On the Internet, that doesn't mean anything. This, once we see a baseline deviation and two confirmations within the same five second period, it's right at the beginning of this clip. You're going to see that that's where we see a conflicting gesture behavior here. And uh, when she's, when he says she had to, she had to, he shakes his head. No again. So we're starting to see a little pattern here. And he does this with his eyes closed, uh, kind of an internal dialogue at around four or five o'clock for, for our viewing four or five o'clock. And I want you to pay attention to, what I call a politeness spike. When Dr. Phil's asking this question, I want you to listen for the rest of all these videos. When does he say yes, sir, or no, sir, instead of just yes or no? So when we see a sudden shift in politeness, I, this happened to me. I did an interrogation in Los Angeles. It was kind of a concierge interrogation. And this young guy I was interviewing said, no, no, and called me bro and dude throughout the entire interview. And then when I started getting to the real questions, he goes, oh, no, sir, absolutely not. No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> so we see this big mountain spike of politeness. And I want you to just pay attention there. When Dr. Phil asked about the bag of cell phones, he said, yes, sir. Really? Yes, sir. So we see a spike there. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, I think we get here something of the arrogance of Prince Andrew. Do you, re do you remember back when we talked about Prince Andrew? He would say, well, in the Navy, like, you know, you just don't understand. You, you can't possibly understand this situation. He says the only thing is and then goes into this idea of the bag of probably, probably 11 cell phones. And he treats what essentially is a major abnormality. I mean, I know some people with, with plenty of cell phones, but they don't have 11. Like 11 is a major abnormality in the amount of cell phones that any human being can possibly cope with, I would say. Um, she probably had at least 11 of them. Really? Well, that's a major abnorm abnormality. You're not going to just brush that aside. And we get that kind of not really an eye block there. I think Chase, it's those eyes of superiority. Like I got you here. What's beautiful about this is Dr. Phil here plays the innocent. He goes, really? Really? Like, just tell me more. Really? because that's going to elicit more information. And I think, you know, the takeaway for this, for, for you watching this right now is, can you be, when you need information out of people, can you be just that little bit more innocent about it? That little bit more naive, because that can pull a lot of great information out there. 
you know, Dr. Phil's got a lot of time on this. He's got a full interview. He doesn't need to come in really aggressive, just really innocent. I really don't understand this. I'm unsure what, just tell me what's going on because I'm an innocent, I don't get it. And eventually it's going to be his undoing and it affords the opportunity for a change as well. You've now got somewhere to go. If you play the innocent, then you can suddenly have data and information and play the opposite and destabilize the situation. I think that's what we're going to see further down the line is Dr. Phil change from the innocent into somebody who now has some information and now knows something. And that's going to put him into, into what you know others here would call pre-confession because he knows he now has somebody who's brighter and a little bit sharper than him. There, that's what I got for you. Did she just walk away from the apartment, you think? I'm sure someone picked her up. She doesn't walk anywhere. So you think she called somebody to come get her? She had to. Her cell phone has apparently not been on since she left. How would she communicate with people without her cell phone? The only thing is is she has a bag of cell phones, and that's what I told Houston police. Um, she probably has at least 11 of them. Really? Yes, sir. All right. Here we go. Well, let's talk about some of the suspicious behavior that you want to respond to. There were reports that when the police went into the apartment, areas had been cleaned up with bleach. That was really blown out of proportion. There are two areas where I had been cleaning up before by the computer desk that we used that Walmart off-brand carpet cleaner and it bleached the carpet, two stains. They had been there for months. So you didn't clean up, because of course what people think, right. they're gonna be suspicious, say, okay, fight ensued, blood is spilled. Right. Bleach cleans that up, right. bleach gets rid of DNA evidence. Right. And the first thing I did was tell Houston, PD, please go in there with a fine tooth comb and look at the apartment, please. All right, Greg, what do you got? So that if you stop that video at the very beginning, you'll see that snarky kind of toothy thing he's got going on. That's not even a, that's not duper delight. That's snarky. Hey, I, I did away with the evidence. I know that they're not going to find it. My guess is if he killed her on the bed, he took the bed clothing, whatever. He didn't use the bleach. He is impressed with himself. He's got suspicious. The minute you say something about suspicious behavior and you ask him the question, watch that blink rate. Bam, bam, bam. Uh oh, here it comes. I better be ready for this. So he's getting some fight or flight there. It doesn't go really big, but you can see just a bit. That right eye comes up and asks for approval as he's telling the story. His left eye appears to be a little close to me. I can't tell exactly from there, but it looks like he's getting that dominant eye closure thing going on again, like we saw in, in Tarek, where people try to get away. And then he goes to one of my favorites, I always say on the show, Chaff and Redirect. You gave me a chance to talk about something. I'm gonna tell you about Walmart's poor quality of their floor cleaner. There were reports that when the police went into the apartment, areas had been cleaned up with bleach. That was really blown out of proportion. There are two areas where I had been cleaning up before by the computer desk that we used that Walmart off-brand carpet cleaner and it bleached the carpet, two stains. They had been there for months. And then I'm so smart that I'm gonna get away with that. And so he, anytime you give him a chance, he's going to take that and run with it. That's all I'm going to cover here because there's a lot to go here and everybody will get their chance to go around. But uh, Chase, what do you got? We see him kick it off with the closed eye talking again, which Mark says suggests superiority. Like that person in your neighborhood who, while he's walking, the dog picks up all the trash in the neighborhood. And you ask him, hey, thanks. That's great that you pick up the trash. And he talks with his eyes closed and goes, oh, yeah, well, you know, I just try to try to do what's best for the neighborhood. That's what we're seeing. Some superiority there. But uh, he shifts very briefly to past perfect. Not that I cleaned up a mess before, but I had been cleaning up before. There are two areas where I had been cleaning up before. And this shift from past to past perfect is a deception indicator, which means that it, once they pile up, then we're starting to see deception. And there's a brief uptick in the blink rate. It goes from about an 18 to about a 64 uh, during this question here. And the whole story is about him and how great he is. And I know, Dr. Phil, not only are you familiar with the law enforcement down there, you've worked legal cases uh, many times down there in Harris County. So I'd love to hear what you think here. 
Well, I thought this was um, a time that he things started to get away from him a little bit and he panicked a little bit. And I thought his blink rate went way out of control because um, when I asked him about this, I did a assumptive presentation in saying, there are some things you want to talk about. Well, let's talk about some of the suspicious behavior that you want to respond to because they look bad for you. And I, I said it as though we had some pre-agreement that you want to answer these to clear your name. Well, let's talk about some of the suspicious behavior that you want to respond to. There were reports that when the police went into the apartment, areas had been cleaned up with bleach. At that point, he didn't know how to undo that. So he started talking before he thought, well, oh, I, just, I wasn't even finished with the last syllable before he jumped into that. So I, I just presented him with a, a, an, a, an assumptive uh, preface in, you want to talk about this? And he went for it instantly. And I thought about halfway through the answer, uh, I, I saw his, him start to color up in his neck right here and his cheek over here. And I thought, okay, this isn't as much fun as he thought it was going to be. That was really blown out of proportion. There are two areas where I had been cleaning up before by the computer desk that we used that Walmart off-brand carpet cleaner and it bleached the carpet, two stains. They had been there for months. So you didn't clean up, because of course what people think, right. they're gonna be suspicious, say, okay, fight ensued, blood is spilled, right. bleach cleans that up, right. bleach gets rid of DNA evidence. Right. And the first thing I did was tell Houston, PD, please go in there with a fine tooth comb and look at the apartment, please. I think he had an answer for it, but I think he thought, wait a minute, I'm not in complete control here anymore because he's got me answering things I didn't want to talk about, and he told me that I did, and he didn't feel quite as in control as he did before. Excellent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, huge asymmetry happening in the face between what Greg is describing there as I can't even do it with one of, one of my, I can't do it with one of my eyebrows, but that, that look of approval, look for approval with one, then the, the other side of the mouth is doing something else. Now, always with asymmetry, you got to check out, well, is there some kind of palsy there? Maybe that some different musculature that, that can be the face, but that can be the, the, the case, but but we see him do some symmetry in the face at other times. What he's got is this hugely asymmetrical expression happening now and again. And we see that expression throughout history in art as the expression of a trickster. Now, this, this an archetype, the trickster, something chaotic, somebody who, who dupes and, uh, and is kind of a lord of chaos, essentially. Now, uh, you know, does that mean that that's what he is? No. What, what history is trying to tell us is it's trying to say, watch out if you're seeing somebody who has two sides of the face very different. It's not saying, look, this is always the case, but history is trying to say, just, just watch out for that because there's enough DNA information that says if you get that difference from one side of the face to the other, there may be some duplicity involved and you want to be watching out for duplicity. So that's why in art, across the world you'll see characters portrayed where one side of their body or one side of their face is extremely different from the other and that's the trickster archetype and you want to watch out because they are purposely trying to create chaos now uh, another moment where this trickster comes in is this idea of the Walmart off-brand carpet cleaner. And there are two areas where I had been cleaning up before by the computer desk that we use that Walmart off-brand carpet cleaner. So he's now blaming the quality. I mean, why is that? Why is that important? It's Walmart and it's off-brand. Yeah, it is a chaff and redirect, as Greg was saying there, but it's also that idea of well, there's, there's something which is a substitute, like it wasn't good enough. 
wasn't good enough and it acted in a way that you just don't expect. So again, playing another archetype of chaos on us, trying to tell the audience, trying to tell Dr. Phil and the whole audience, you know what, this is just chaos. I mean, how could we ever get to a right answer or a solution when the world around is so duplicitous, so chaotic? Please, Dr. Phil, just pack up the cameras and go because, you, you know, you don't want to be around this kind of nonsense. Uh, we see the smug, as, the smug eyes that, that Chase was talking about there. We see him smiling as he's so helpful in this situation. There's just so much information in there that anybody, you watching, of course, you'd go, there's something up here and something to watch out for. There, that's what I got for you there. Have we, have we heard from everybody? Uh, I was, uh, it was me left, but you guys have covered everything. <laughs> You've done it. Everything's been covered from I flutter to the uh, the bad bleaching incident it's got going on. So I'll just to save time. All right, let's move along. Well, let's talk about some of the suspicious behavior that you want to respond to. There were reports that when the police went into the apartment, areas had been cleaned up with bleach. That was really blown out of proportion. There are two areas where I had been cleaning up before by the computer desk that we used that Walmart off-brand carpet cleaner and it bleached the carpet, two stains. They had been there for months. So you didn't clean up, because of course what people think, right. if they're gonna be suspicious, say okay, fight and sue, blood is spilled, right. bleach cleans that up, right. bleach gets rid of DNA evidence. Right. And the first thing I did was tell Houston, CD, please go in there with a fine tooth comb and look at the apartment, please. You were seen loading boxes and blankets into yes, sir. her car mm -hmm. that night. And well, you, but you understand that what people then say, well, what's he putting in the car? I mean, there are clothes and, and stuff like that. I mean, there are Office Depot boxes and then blankets and then most of our stuff I brought here in trash bags because I didn't have anything else to load them in. But you didn't come here intending to stay. You came here to drop him off. At first, it was to drop him off and, and go back and then try to deal with it. But after talking to my family, they didn't want to see it start up again. She basically owns me in a, in a lot of ways. And I, I admit that. I, I cave to Michelle nine-tenths of the time. So, Greg, what do you got? So, what, I'm only going to cover a couple of things. This, I never hear anywhere else in the entire show. Mm -hmm. Her car mm -hmm. that night. When you ask what was he taking out, boxes and stuff, he does an mm-hmm, and he's looking down and to the right. We typically associate all of this down here with feeling, not with thinking. So when a person's down and to the right, I associate that with emotion to their right. So when he's doing that and then he goes, mm-hmm, there's a red flag for me. I want to dig in and say, okay, it was clothes and what? Clothes and her, clothes and other. We know, I think, now that she wasn't in that first part, but people saw him bringing out boxes. And then when you ask him about going to take the kid, he says at first, but he's tongue juts beforehand. You came here to drop him off? At first it was to drop him off. Usually we think of distasteful subjects when a person pushes something out of their mouth. That's Desmond Morris 101, that's way back. He says that babies, the first way they learn to reject things is by pushing a nipple out of their mouth or pushing food out of their mouth. So if that's the way it goes, then you know it, it carries through. And then he goes back into more chaff and redirect. He's going to give you a lot of details about things that don't matter, but no details about the things that do. At first, it was to drop him off and, and go back and then try to deal with it. But after talking to my family, they didn't want to see it start up again. She basically owns me in a, in a lot of ways. And the reason people chaff and redirect is like an aircraft blasting out something for missiles to follow is hopefully you'll pick up one of those things they drop and follow it to ground. Hey, it was a Home Depot box. It was a Office Depot box. It was a whatever. All of that stuff is just there as a lead. And when you're interrogating someone, a lead is something you want to pick up and take information from. If the lead has no value, it's a dead end. That's what he's doing is dropping dead leads or cold leads so that she's hoping you'll chase that story down. Uh, Dr. Phil, what do you got? Well, at this point, Put yourself in his position and think about everything that's accumulated just in this interview at this point. In this interview at this point, she has just miraculously disappeared from a bedroom, no car, no, no keys, no cell phone, and now you're 
have, have just said there's bleach all over the apartment. You're carrying out large boxes that a body would fit in, supposedly full of clothes, just to drop your son off and come right back. So you're you're packing up for multiple seasons to go drop a kid off and 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 come back. At this point, you should be thinking, if you're in a hole, stop digging. And but he's just he he just keeps he just keeps going. Anybody that was reading the room or the situation, I, I would have called in a bomb threat if I needed to get out of this conversation at this point. I'm on national television. This is 100% of the United States and 57 foreign countries are watching this happen. And I haven't been asked the hard question yet. And all of this is accumulating. And I I'm still thinking this is going OK. Uh, that is extreme narcissism. And it's beginning to show up with ticks and blink rates and head movements and tongue thrust. He's moving in his chair. He's looking around the room. If he has taken any inventory of everything that's accumulated just in the last 20 minutes, uh, he should have been exiting this interview in a fast, fast hurry. All right. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to add to all of that stuff that you were saying there, Dr. Phil, about blink rate, uh, the lips are going. This is very much off his former, you know, kind of cool, casual, confident baseline. But here's another baseline to look at. Dr. Phil's he's Dr. Phil, you've kind of flipped a switch now because because now the innocent has disappeared. Now, Dr. Phil is is in there really strong, direct, targeted mm. eye contact as well. And I think that's heating the situation up. Now, if, if I believe if Dr. Phil had started, if you'd have started with that kind of interrogation method, he'd have put up all kinds of walls. You know, we'd have never seen we'd have never seen that state change and he would never experience that state change because that change of state unbalances people. If you can take them from one emotional state to another, they destabilize and they're going to make mistakes. So beautiful little kind of gear shift into that because now his shoulders are dancing. The blink rate is up. We have that upward inflection at the start and this lighter voice as well. Where, here's where we see him go. Here's his defense mechanism around this is he goes, he retreats back and to the side and goes for the victim status again. She basically owns me in a, in a lot of ways. And I, I admit that. Now, the reason I believe he's doing this is he understands consciously or unconsciously something of what we call uh, the Cartman dra drama triangle, which is if there's a victim, it naturally means that there must be a persecutor, there must be a villain somewhere, and there must be a rescuer to this. So if I can play the victim, it means, well, the audience will find an aggressor somewhere, because if I'm the victim, there has to be an aggressor. So they'll find one, and we've already set that up, okay? And, and we know who that is, that's the wife, she's the aggressor here, and it leaves one role left, which is for Dr. Phil, which is, you'll be the rescuer, okay? You'll come in and help me. Well, of course, what Dr. Phil does is doesn't take that role. He decides, oh, I'm not taking the role of the rescuer here. He stays right in the center of this triangle, and he's just the inquirer. He's just like, I'm just gonna ask more questions. I'm not gonna persecute you around this. I'm not gonna rescue you. I'm just going to ask more questions around this. You're not going to cast me in that role. And that's a problem now for this guy because playing the victim now isn't going to help, isn't going to get uh, Dr. Phil to jump in and save his life. At the same time, it's not going to cause Dr. Phil to be the persecutor. Again, any incisive questioning is still questioning. It's not a persecutor. So, Nice try by our guy there, but but effectively not really good enough. 
Uh, Scott, what do you got on this? I, I, I agree with you, Mark. But at the top there, when he, when he, when he first asked that question about loading boxes, you know, he says, uh, you were seen loading boxes and, bl and boxes and blankets into the car. He says, he, it sounds like a little five-year-old. He says, yeah, uh-huh. And the uh-huh is so high, it's like four tones up from that, four notes up. You were seen loading boxes and blankets into yes, sir. her car mm -hmm. that night. This is what I thought was a brilliant play, was when Dr. Phil puts the, who, want, who wants to know that's like, I want to know. What do you, He didn't say, so what's up with those boxes? He didn't say that. He said, others want to know. You were seen loading boxes and blankets into yes, sir. her car mm -hmm. that night. He put the blame on other people so it doesn't direct back to him so he can stay in there with him. It's a great tactic, and it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a good one to use. This is why, this is another reason he has no earthly idea he's in an interrogation. But you understand that what people then say, well, what's he putting in the car? Because when you start doing things like that to, re to replace the attack was somebody else saying, look, these people want to know this about you. What's that about? But you understand that what people then say, well, what's he putting in the car? That's a, that's a, you did that so well. Hats off to that. That's a, a beautiful move there. Um, when he talks about moving the clothes. There are clothes and, and stuff like that. I mean, there are Office Depot boxes and then blankets and then most of our stuff I brought here in trash bags because I didn't have anything else to load them in. It's just fluff. It's just, it's just, it's just filler and fluff what he's talking about. You're right, Dr. Feathers. Uh, he, what is he going to do? Take everything he owns there and then back for what? To just to drop the kid off? It's it's none of it makes any sense. Um, but I think his anger starts to show when he talks about how, how he owns how she owns him. She basically owns me in a in a lot of ways, and I, I admit that I, I cave to Michelle nine tenths of the time. I think he might be you know, those, those little nerds that always got picked on, and but he was really smart as a kid. And he know, knew, you know, he was under the impression he knew more than anybody else. But I think he got tired of being picked on. He's got a girlfriend who does that to him as well, because I think his personality <laughs> probably leans the, the direction to let that happen. And so she's bullying him and being mean to him. And I think he finally just popped. I think he probably, as they're fighting before, as he goes through this later on, they would get in these fusses and, and, and fights. I think he got close a couple of times, because I think you were right, Dr. Phil, when you asked him if he was choking her out. I think he probably did a couple of times and thought, oh, I could go that far again. But he got lucky the other times and didn't pop anything or turn anything off while he was doing that. And this time he lucked out and he, and he, he, he totally, it totally went sideways on him. Um, and then we start all, all that shoulder moving and all those things. That just says he's, he's not confident with what he's saying. I think as he's reliving those things, as he's telling these stories, it's it's triggering his, his limbic system. And it's sort of making him uneasy. So as he's going forward, he knows this thing's going to come to an end. I think inside he knows he's going to he's going to give up at some point and going to tell because later on we're going to see him want to tell so bad, but he doesn't. So I think that that's his limbic system saying not yet, not yet, not yet as he goes through these because he's reliving these things as he's talking about them. So that's what I got. Chase, what do you got? If I'm carrying a casket at a funeral, I'm technically carrying clothes and stuff. Because that would be an accurate statement. So I think that that is true to him. I think he believes that that's true. And I think when he's saying trash bags, that's when we're seeing those two single shoulder shrugs. Most of our stuff I brought here in trash bags because I didn't have anything else to load them in. And the single shoulder shrug, to clarify what Scott was saying for you, is different than double shoulder shrugs. You see somebody raise both shoulders, it's more likely to be an unconscious apology for what they're saying or what they lack in, in what they're saying. The single shoulder shrug is more likely to denote or indicate that they lack confidence. One of the, the best trainings I've ever had in, in deception detection came in psychology school where it was talking about the detection of malingering and when someone's faking an illness or a feigned illness. And they have so many things there that whether or not someone chooses to hide a piece of information is very telling. So if we're talking to a predator, like someone who's accused of a sexual crime, a forensic uh, interviewer, and I'm sure, uh, Dr. Phil, you'd be able to clarify this, but is whether or not did they try to hide their condition? If, they're, if they're, I'm claiming I have a mental illness, whether or not they hid it from other people it is, is very telling. And I think there's a lot of deliberately missing information here. A lot. Oh. Yep. Yeah. 
You were seen loading boxes and blankets into yes, sir. her car mm -hmm. that night. And well, you, but you understand that what people then say, well, what's he putting in the car? I mean, there are clothes and, and stuff like that. I mean, there are Office Depot boxes and then blankets and then most of our stuff I brought here in trash bags because I didn't have anything else to load them in. But you didn't come here intending to stay. You came here to drop him off. At first, it was to drop him off and, and go back and then try to deal with it. But after talking to my family, they didn't want to see it start up again. She basically owns me in a, in a lot of ways. And I, I admit that. I, I cave to Michelle nine-tenths of the time. All right, we good? Yep. Here we go. Um, there were hard drives in the computers, uh, and you took those out took when those you out. left to come up here. Why she, did you do that? She took hard drives out of my truck that were my personal drives that I had taken. So you uh, drive around with hard drives? Yes, sir. Now, when Houston PD contacted me, I told them that I took the drives. Well, you said you would show them to me when yes, I Yes, yeah, I have the drives. Do you have them here? Yes. Can we, can we look at them? Yeah, I'll bring them to you. One yeah, second. Um, no, I don't have them because he still has them. He's still copying them. OK, well, you can come back. OK, sorry. Yeah. I thought I already, he brought them back, but he didn't. I thought I did, I, but I forgot. Okay, so you don't have them? I don't have them. But so he, where are they? They're at a friend's house here in Odessa. He's an IT professional, and he's the one extracting the information for me so that the drives remain in the state that they should be so that the police can investigate. You, you said you were going to show those to us, and you got up and walked to the door and then said, oh, that's right, they're not here. But not 15 minutes before we got here, you told my producer they weren't here. You already knew they weren't here when you got up to go get them. My mind is scatterbrained right now. I mean, I, I forgot. All right, I'm gonna go first on this one. This is so awesome. Um, we see that, that the mouth movement is becoming is, is becoming more predominant in this situation. His tongue's coming out and pulling that lip in. It's a little bigger than it was the last time. It's a lot bigger actually than it was the last time. And that lets us know there's an issue there for him. There's an issue here. Uh, his, pre, his, his answer is prepared. And he's running it as Dr. Phil finishes that question. And as he starts delivering it, we can see, he, he, again, he has the structure down, but he doesn't have the specific details with it. And here's how we know, because he says, now. Now, when Houston PD contacted me. And then he starts giving his story. It's like saying, all right, here we go. And then you, then you give your story. Now, when Houston PD contacted me, I told him that I took the drives. As he's explained all this, he locks eyes with Dr. Phil because he's a little bit, at that point, he's on, he's on notice for what's going on. Uh, we're all going to cover a, a lot of this stuff, but I'll get down to the part where he says where he goes in, in, to get the uh, hard drives. This is my favorite part. It's the worst acting. It's worse than the, almost as bad as that girl we had in the last video. Look at him. Yeah, I'll bring it to you. One yeah, second. Um, no, I don't have them because he still has them. He looks like a like a fourth grader in the play of, and, and he's playing a cowboy, and he walks up like he's walking up, going. Well, my name is Cowboy Bob, because he starts marching like that, then he stops, this fake stop. But the thing that was the coolest thing in here, the most awesome thing he did, Dr. Phil, was say, you can come back. OK, well, you can come back. OK, sorry. Yeah. I thought I already, he brought them back, but he didn't. In his own place, in his parents' home, you took the leading role in his parents' house. OK, well, you can come back. OK, sorry. Yeah. I thought I already, he brought them back, but he didn't. You're telling him what he can do in his parents' house up over his father at that point, man, I just, I, I, I just, I just can't get past that. That was a, that was a great move. That was a great move. Okay, well, you can come back. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I thought I already, he brought them back, but he didn't. There was a point at the end of that where he gave me all of that answer, and I responded with just a look. And that's the point in the interview. He knew, and I knew this was over. Yeah. Uh, Everything after that was window dressing. He knew I knew. I knew. He knew I knew. <laughs> and he knew I knew. He knew I knew <laughs> uh, at that point. Well, How if you go you into an that? interrogation and you want to make a mistake, tell an outright lie that everybody knows you're lying to and then try to tell the truth after that or try to hide it after that because you just played your biggest card. That's why I said, guys, go back and look at every one of these videos when he lies. 
He eye blocks. He raises his right eyebrow. He did it in this one. It's clear and it's evident. He did lip compression beforehand. He outright blocks. You can't miss him. I mean, it, in all my time of interrogating, I wish people would come in and say, hey, here's a big lie, and I want you to start my interrogation this way. And then all the real heavy stuff you do afterward. The, the easy part for me is he goes into kinesthetic, that whole feeling versus thinking. And the, the indicator so in, in intelligence interrogation, I'm after breaking someone. And that's a euphemism for getting them to violate their own trust and talk. That's all it is. And a confession is breaking a criminal. That's, that's a difference. There's two differences there. And what I can always tell is just before they break, whether it's for intelligence or whether it's for police interrogation, is they'll go in internal conversation, get emotional, internal. And all they're doing is reinforcing whatever craziness that they, they've thought up. And they're on the cascade then. But most people are not stupid enough to outright lie about something you already know the answer to. And then, boom, that's arrogance for you, though. All right. Chase, sorry. Yeah, I think it, that downward eye movement was uh, exactly what I did when I was uh, getting towards the end of the slap chop infomercial. And I actually ordered it, which <laughs> I maybe shouldn't have. I bought a slap chop. I don't even know what that is. I, I, think, I think it's great. Uh, this is a great illustration of the blink rate uh, just skyrocketing uh, for a person in this video that you see that I think I'm in an open field and suddenly realize that I'm standing in a corner. And I'm not, I, I'm starting to realize I'm not the smartest guy in the room right now. And and that was, a, that's a very hard, uh, hard realization for a narcissist uh, like we are likely dealing with here that being accused of something they actually did is one of the, one of the worst things you can do uh, for, for a narcissist. And this lip licking that we see here is a grooming hygienic gesture. So subconsciously, we say a lot of things that are going on in this person's head, a lot of it's unconscious. So a lot of these behaviors are complete. He's unaware of a lot of this. But we do this to improve our appearance for other people. And this is especially present when we're deceiving another person. Our brain says, the mammalian brain says, I need to improve my appearance. It's going to sell this thing a little bit better. And that's what we're seeing right away. And I think it's fascinating. I'm uh, surprised it hadn't been picked up on yet. But he's standing there by the door when he turns around and looks back at, at Phil and he's got one hand kind of covering his lower abdomen and another hand almost kind of covering his groin. And then when he starts speaking, his hands are flat at his sides like, like a preschooler uh, who's in trouble uh, in school. So we're seeing this guilt behavior. And these, it's so fascinating that it, this is an unconscious thing. We're not seeing something that's conscious. If you take the amount of human history that we've been communicating nonverbally versus what we've been since language was invented. Uh, language is pretty new for our species. And that's why a lot of this stuff is hardwired into our bodies. That's why we're born knowing how to smile, frown, show disgust and all the other stuff. Uh, Mark? Yeah, I'm just going to say one thing about this. And it's just something that we all need to look out for. I'm not saying it's happening in this particular interview, but it could be. So many people have commented on, um, you know, the, the lip action that we see from this particular subject but i want you to check out that actually dr phil does some work with his lips beforehand now we've always got to check this out because if you've got a high status interviewer sometimes you can get mirroring of that interviewer so in in some if i were doing a, an analysis of this i might well go okay i just want to discount what happened in that person's lips because it was quite close to what happened in the high status interviewer's lips. I think we see it in, uh, in the interview where Dr. Phil, you, you interviewed Jean Benet's uh, brother, I believe it was. And we see in that some, a lot of compliance from, from uh, the, the subject in that. Uh, nothing wrong with any of this, by the way, <laughs> but I just think, you know, you at home, you need to, realize that some behaviors will be 
just normal mirroring behaviors, especially when you've got somebody of status. We, we copy the strongest, clearest signal in the room. That's the leader. Also, we copy the signals from the people who we perceive hold the most valuable resource, i.e. they are of high status. Now, not only, obviously, is, you know, because Dr. Phil's on TV, like, like he's known, that's going to be high status. But also at this point, I think from you know our last uh, our last video on, he's taken a lot of control over this, and he's taking even more control. So I think what we're going to see is a little bit more mirroring, potentially a little bit more compliance, and we just want to watch out for that. I, I don't believe it's happening too much in this particular video, but worth thinking about for others that you might look at. There, that's what I got for you on that one. Excellent. All right, is that everybody? Yep. Yeah. I'll like to say two things um, to give you, uh, at least the viewers, some behind the scenes things that were going on because they're not necessarily evident on camera. But I think they're interesting. We're in we're in his parents' house in Odessa, Texas, when this is happening, and he had driven from Houston to Odessa initially to drop the child off, uh, which he did. Then he drove back to Houston because he had to deal with reality there. And then he had come back, but we're in we're in this house, and it's maybe uh, fifteen hundred square feet or so. I mean, it's a it's a it's a nice home in a nice neighborhood. But when you bring production in there, you've got lights and production team, and everybody's on top of everybody. So he and I are kind of sitting in a. <laughs> sort of a entry hall slash living room area. And the kitchen is right over here to our left. And there are standing his family members watching this whole thing Ooh. happen. Wow. I, I think his mother was there. I mean, there were different family members standing there. And I happened to be traveling that day with my son, Jay, um, who had graduated from UT and then SMU Law School and uh, is very astute at interrogation and all. And he's standing next to the mother. And all of this getting up out of his chair and going back, the mother knew the answer to my question uh. when he stood up and, and did that. And she watched all of this unfolding and saw him caught in this lie. And I'm watching her out of the corner of my eye. And at that point, she knew. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah, that's tough. Because wow. I think up until that point, she and family members were all in believing and supporting him. And I think at that point, she clearly knew he was guilty that he had done this and the entire tone and mood in the home shifted at that point and the disdain from his his family had been there in support of him and all of a sudden they were like leaning back in judgment looking at him with disdain, at, at, I think they were sick at their stomachs at, at that point. The, I'm just saying the entire mood in the, in the home and situation circumstance shifted at that point. That's why, that's why I say at that point it was over. He lost his, he lost his family. He, and contrast to how I started out in the interview to that look, that I gave him at that point when he said what he said and got up and moved, the entire thing had shifted to the point that his family was now standing essentially behind me like a firing squad looking at him. And so the wheels were coming off pretty fast at this point. Um, there were hard drives in the computers uh, and you took those out took when those you out. left to come up here. Why she, did you do that? She took hard drives out of my truck that were my personal drives that I had taken. So you drive around with hard drives? Yes, sir. Now, when Houston PD contacted me, I told them that I took the drives. 
Well, you said you would show them to me when yes, I came yeah, here Yes, I have today. the drives. Do you have them here? Yes. Can we, can we look at them? Yeah, I'll bring them to you. One yeah, second. Um, no, I don't have them because he still has them. He's still copying them. Oh, okay, well, you can come back. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I thought I already he brought them back, but he didn't. I thought I did, I, but I forgot. Okay, so you don't have them? I don't have them. But so he, where are they? They're at a friend's house here in Odessa. He's an IT professional, and he's the one extracting the information for me so that the drives remain in the state that they should be so that the police can investigate. You, you said you were going to show those to us, and you got up and walked to the door and then said, oh, that's right, they're not here. But not 15 minutes before we got here, you told my producer they weren't here. You already knew they weren't here when you got up to go get them. My mind is scatterbrained right now. I mean, I, I forgot. Okay. Did you do anything to her that would be considered foul play or criminal? No, no. Did you kill her? No, sir. You didn't do anything to her. You, you don't have her. No. Somewhere. No. You have no. Like I said, she no has run. In she has disputes. run over me. I have let her run over me. There would be those who said, you finally got enough. She pushed you too far. You finally said, by God, that's enough. You know what? And you blew up on her. I didn't have to do anything like that. If she is watching this right now, let's she say can she's come home so, and what do you she, say to her? She, we can fix this. We can fix to where she gets help. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, it feels really good because there's a lot of strong denial in there. Did you do anything to her that would be considered foul play or criminal? No, no. So, so I think in his mind, he has really worked out. I'm gonna, if that question comes, I'm gonna deny, I'm gonna deny. And he's not doing a particularly bad job of, of really strong denial there. You don't have her hidden somewhere, <laughs> says, says Dr. Phil, and we see just a minute eye deviation over to the side. Now I'm going to let uh, somebody else, you know, maybe Greg, uh, go, well, you know, what might that mean, <clears throat> that slight eye deviation? But you don't have a hidden somewhere and that strong but minute deviation, that for me says you do have a hidden somewhere, don't you? You, you don't have her no. hidden somewhere? No. You have no Like I said, she no is involvement. Right. He jumps straight back into being the victim there. Um, but there's lots of lip, lip bites. She can come home. The eyebrow goes up. The smile is there. There's so much complexity happening all around this and, and incongruence. And so I'm going to pass over to you, to, to you, Greg. Greg, what do you got on that little eye movement there? Anything? <laughs> Let me give you a few things, but a little yeah. eye movement, when a person breaks eye contact that way and they're going after a piece of information, if they're going down, they're looking for internal conversation, they're going to have a conversation about what should I say. The most telling thing in this entire video to me is he has been very polite, he's anchored on Dr. Phil's words, and he's stepping on Dr. Phil trying to ask a question right now. That's rushing to answer. There's a lot of information he wants to get out. I think you're right, he probably rehearsed and he probably is accessing and trying to figure out what the answer is. And then he goes... I don't have to do anything like that. I don't have to do anything like that. Heavy swallow, set jaw, eyes locked. We've seen that before when he lied. I feel like right now he knows he's in a bind. I mean, we're, we're about, I, I think he almost confessed at one point when he was telling you exactly what happened. I choked her one mm -hmm. time and, well, this was the time. So that's what I see, Mark. That quick access is he's trying to recall what he's prepared, but his preparation's gonna come apart here. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Phil, what do you got? Well. Um, generally, in an interrogation, I don't let someone deny it unless I already know it. Um, at this point, as I said, this was over in my mind. I, I knew at this point, I, I, I'd, I'd bet the house, the dog, the, everything I had, this man had killed that woman. Um, all of the evidence said he did. And when he lied the way he did uh, about what he did and gave the, the poor Shakespearean uh, performance about it, um, at that point, I, I knew he had. If I didn't know that, I would not have let him deny it. If I had said, if you murdered her, 
and he started to say, I'd have stopped him and not let him say no, because once they say no, it's a hard face saving way to get out of that. I would have stopped him. And you, you'll see in the next video, I trivialize it. I rationalize it. I do everything I can to make it easy for him to back into it. Uh, and sometimes people have seen me do that uh, on stage. And it's like, it, it seemed like you were trying to justify what they did. In their mind, I am. I'm creating a short-term time frame, and I'm trying to trivialize this in their mind where it's not so hard for them to own to get where we're trying to go. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not going to be held accountable for it. I'm trying to get them to own it. Uh, and, but I, I didn't stop him from saying uh, no, because I already had the answer. Did you do anything to her that would be considered foul play or criminal? No, no. Did you kill her? No, sir. You didn't do anything to her? You, you don't have her? No. Somewhere? No. And I, I knew it was just a matter of connecting the dots for Harris County. And when they saw this interview, uh, I knew they would bring the indictment and do the arrest. And we can talk about what happened here in a minute, but uh, that's what was going through my mind at that point, or I would have stopped him from doing the strong denial. Did you do anything to her that would be considered foul play or criminal? No, no. Did you kill her? No, sir. You didn't do anything to her? You, you don't have her? No. Somewhere? No. Chase, what do you got? So there's a there's a double denial where he says no twice. No, no. Uh, statistically, in, in peer-reviewed research, this is more likely to be done by guilty people than innocent. There's a politeness spike where he says, sir, again, to Dr. Phil. Did you kill her? No, sir. Uh, during this critical phase of the questioning. And when right during the words hidden somewhere, you're going to see this small little shift in behavior. You're going to see the eyes go down in an unusual direction, which flashes back to a different part of this episode, which we're not going to cover here today. But Dr. Phil's standing next to his vehicle and he keeps reasserting, I'm trying to do everything I can. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is hidden. And he keeps hammering on that exact phrase. And I think that that is the phrase uh, for him. That's the that's a trigger phrase for him. We're seeing an emotional response to it. And the, com the campaign is just continuing. It, it, Dr. Phil, you asked a wonderful question. It, what would you say to her? And the whole message is she screwed up. She needs help. Not me, not us. We don't need help. She needs help. And we'll get you some help. Uh, Scott? All right. I think coming out of the gate on this one, his answer, he answered the right, right way. He said no with that no. Did you do anything to her that would be considered foul play or criminal? No, no. Did you kill her? No, sir. You didn't do anything to her? You, you don't have her? No. Hidden somewhere? No. But after that, when you ask someone a question and when you ask somebody if they killed somebody and they didn't do it, they're going to say, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. They're going to go on and on. And the more you ask them questions, the more they're going to stick back with that. They're going to keep going back to that and say, no, I'm telling you, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. We've all seen that. And at this point, he doesn't. He waits for the next one and says, no, no. And then he try, Then the anger comes out a little bit. He goes, no. And then you start poking on him, Dr. Phil, or it sort of gets him fired up a little bit, gets him, gets him in and gets him mad. You, you don't have her. No. Somewhere. No. You have no, like I said, she no is involvement. Right. And this is when his voice starts going up and you can see the, the, you can hear that anger come through. That's the first, that's the loudest he gets in this whole thing is, is during that. That should have been going on at the very top of that when he came out and he said that first no was good. But that second time you ask him, that's when we should have heard this anger. Did you kill her? No, sir. Everybody's covered everything. So I'll, I'll wrap it there. Did you do anything to her that would be considered foul play or criminal? No, no. Did you kill her? No, sir. You didn't do anything to her? You, you don't have her? No. In somewhere? No. You have no involvement in Like I said, she, no has, run, in she has run over me. I've let her run over me. There would be those who said, you finally got enough. She pushed you too far. What? Finally said, by God, that's enough. You know what? And you blew up on her. I didn't have to do anything like that. If she is watching this right now, let's she say she's... She can come home. Uh, and what do you she... say to her? 
she, we can fix this. We can fix to where she gets help. All right, we're good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. If you know more about this than you're saying, if you are involved with something that's happened to her, if you lost your temper and choked her too far or something bad happened, if you are involved in her death in some way, it is a tremendous gift to your son to tell me now when I can help you and I can help him. We, like I said. To, because nobody ever gets away with this. No, like I said, she walked all over me. She just owned me. I didn't hurt her at all. All right, Greg, what do you got? So really easy to tell that you're inside his brain case now. You're inside his head, and the only thing that matters to him right now is what's going on right in that room. And that didn't start off being the case. He was in control. He thought he had absolute control, but now you're inside his head, and the only thing going on is that little dance. You can see the sorrow in his brows as his brows are pulled down. You can see that he's come to realization that I don't I don't know that his sorrow is about her. I think the realization is that, you know, this is over. Yeah. I'm done. You can see it coming very clearly. Both eyes are down. One is down further than the other. His chin is down. <clears throat> now, remember, we said his baseline is his chin's up because he's doing that arrogant look down his nose at you. That's down for him. And lots of reasons people could do that. Some people, because they have a do lap kind of thing, cover their chin or they hold their head up. Other reasons that people just get in that habit of raising their head. His chin is down now, and that's throat protection. We always associate throat protection with pre with pre confession. They're right on the edge. All you got to do is reach out and touch him. You've already gotten him. You already got him there. He says we, and he does a long sentence before he says no. I basically didn't do it. And then he comes out, and I think what he's trying to say to you without losing face is she walked all over me. He's admitting all the stuff that you said, and that is, to me, just stepping right into pre-confession. And then yeah. when he says that about her, his head's back up. It's interesting. He's back to who he is. He's saying she did mistreat me and, and, and. Like I said, she walked all over me. She just owned me. I didn't hurt her at all. But you can see all that sorrow, and I think he's just right on the edge of falling off the cliff there. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I absolutely agree with you. And he's still faced through all these potential guilt questions that Dr. Phil's asking, which means an innocent person not likely to do that. They're going to start shaking their head from the beginning. If they're not saying anything or interrupting the interrogator, they're going to start shaking their head or they'll do what's called pre-denial behaviors. And none of that is there. And so that's, that's a humongous red flag. There's a smirk here with more duping delight uh, at just getting away with this when he says, oh, no. And then you see a little smirk. He does, Greg, you were talking about his chin being down with his pre-confession. He does lift it up once to talk about something that he's proud of. And I think this is the carefully crafted storyline of she owned me because we hear him say this a couple of times. And I think he's proud of that. But what we don't see here is a denial. We don't see a, a strong, confident denial of commission. And right at the end, we see something very telltale that we all learn in interrogation school kind of on day one, which is called severity softening. So instead of saying steal, someone might say take. Instead of saying uh, rape, someone might say interfere with or touch. And instead of saying kill, you might hear somebody say the word hurt. And we hear that word come out here. So we see, we, we see the severity softening here, which is a, another very large uh, red flag. Mark? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. She owned me, Chase, because something just hit me right now. If you're owned by somebody, it means that you're a slave. And, and enslaving somebody is one of the top crimes you can do on the planet. So this idea of she owned me, causes him to be a victim of one of the worst possible crimes and places, you know, the, the victim of this actual crime as a, a, a heinous criminal. It's, it's kind of a brilliant move in some ways, but, but really not good enough. But I see what he's trying to do there with that idea of she owned me, the metaphor of I, I'm a slave, you must 
feel me to be the victim and this person to be the persecutor of a horrible, horrible crime. Uh, I often talk about the slow blink, the slow blink of acceptance. This is one of the best examples I've seen of what that rate is of slow blink. Dr. Phil says, if you know more about this than you are saying, go and watch that blink and exactly what rate that is. That isn't the, the blink of stress, that's the blink of saying, yes, I accept. In this case, I know more than I'm saying. I, I love to see that. I'm gonna strip that out and, and put that as the textbook example of the slow blink of acceptance. The last thing, uh, last couple of things on this, uh, I see what I, what I would call waxy face. He's about to change state. He's moving from one really strong emotion to another, and that transition of emotions often causes what I call waxy face, where all the muscles relax. That's when you know somebody's going into a different state. And, and so I think, just like you, there is the potential here that he's about to confess. He's really thinking about, oh, I really need to move to a different emotion there. So beautiful waxy face on him there. Then the last thing, I didn't hurt her, dot, 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 at all. Sorry, there's too much gap <laughs> between the two. <laughs> there's too much extra stress on that. My belief is, is you did hurt her a lot in this particular situation. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this? All right, taking into consideration everything you guys said, everybody's spot on. And I think uh, everything we're seeing here when he starts hiding that, that, that neck, that chin comes down, he was in pre-confession, man. I think he was right there. Dr. Phil, you had him. He was so close. When I first started watching this, and at the top it says he confesses uh, because we get that later on. We get that information later on. I thought this was it. I thought, okay, here he goes. And I thought you were going to do this. I thought for sure. It would be out of character for you. Greg and I talked about this before. I thought you were going to lean in, put your hand on his shoulder and say, listen, man, it's okay. Every, everybody makes mistakes. I understand. And maybe start that little fake cry just a little like you're going to cry with him a little bit. You say, I, it's okay. It's okay. Tell me. Tell me what happened. I, and because I know if you had done that, that cat would have, he would have just, he would have thrown it all up. We know you can't do that in that situation. Uh, Greg, explain why, how yeah, well, we know with that. This well, number one, with his family there as well. Like I, I was going to say earlier, there's a lot of things that we could do that you can't do because you're Dr. Phil. I mean, you're this character that everybody knows and they they have in their head a place. So you can't do certain things. You can't play dumb. You can't do that kind of stuff where the rest of us can. So th there's that. But having the other nuance is having your whole family there. That's tough for a person oh, to confess yeah. in front of their whole family. Yeah. But he was there. I, he was right there, I think. He was right yeah. there. Dr. Phil, what do you got? Well, nobody nobody confesses in a crowd. Um, you know, they... You, he's going to want to get off. I'm, I'm thinking in my head, he's going to want to do this. He knows I know. And as I said, I know he knows. And it's just a matter of getting him in a situation where he'll do it. Uh, do we have the phone call? All right, Sarah, I understand we have a significant update in this case. Tell me what's happening. I got a text message this morning at about noon from Mark saying, I confessed, I killed her. You can see it right here on the text. And I immediately called him back. So he's calling you from where? He's calling me from the Houston Police Department interrogation mm -hmm. room. And he told me that he had killed Michelle. So was there a fight that night? Yes. He said there was a fight. You know, we were fighting. And I, you know, she's swinging at me. And I grabbed her, you know, next snap. And I fell on the bed choking her. And the next thing I know, it was over with. He strangled her, he grabbed her neck, he said that it popped, and he knew she was dead. He says that he covered her with a blanket. I covered her up because I could hear Caden wanting to come in and see what was going on. And so I covered her up, put her on the bed, and covered her up with a blanket, told him that she was sleeping, and you know, started getting his things ready. I had to get him out of there. Did it happen the night that she went missing? It happened the night she went missing. He said the times are all the same as he told us, but when he drove to Odessa to drop her son off, he had left her body in the apartment in a closet wrapped in a blanket. I wrapped her up before I left. What did you wrap her up in? 
a blanket and then I put her back, her bot, her head in a trash bag so I didn't have to look at her face. I stood there looking at her and I almost called the police then. When he drove back to Houston, he put her body into a container and he put her inside the back seat of the car that you looked inside. And he drove her and he put her body, he tells me, in an oil rig buried in a shallow grave with sand. She's covered up, but she's not really hidden too well. I mean, I, I did this knowingly that I, I'm going to get caught. So, I mean, I covered her up to the point to where it was decent, but as far as burying, burying, no, I, didn't, I, I, I didn't have the strength to do that. He said, I want to tell you I'm so sorry for bringing you and Dr. Phil out to Odessa, Texas. Sorry, I lied to you. Little things like that do bother me. When Dr. Phil asked you, you know, now is the time, if you've done something to confess to me, did part of you want to? Yes, I did. I wanted y'all to call me back, and I just can't stand lying anymore. And that's what she did. Did he say what precipitated this? Why, why did he do it? He says that he was sick of her controlling him and fighting with him, and he wanted what was best for his son. And so he says he snapped. The way this unfolded is he called uh, to talk to me, and he got the producer, Sarah, and he said, look, I, I, I can't lie anymore. I, I just want to tell you I, I did it. I grabbed her, and I fell on top of her and snapped her neck, and um, I... I wrapped her up and I put a trash bag on her head so I didn't have to look at her. And um, what we know now, because he said so in, in court, they determined that uh, he took his son to Odessa, dropped him off, drove back, got her, drove back towards Odessa and buried her in a shallow grave uh, out near an oil field. Um, and then went on to Odessa where I interviewed him. And he called us from uh, the Harris County Jail where they were following up and interrogating him. And um, while Sarah was talking to him on the cell phone, the Harris County Sheriff's Department called her on another line and said, he's on the phone confessing to someone and we're getting it on the cameras and she said i know it's <laughs> me i've got him on the other line and so they recorded the confession that he called to tell me and was giving to sarah because she couldn't find me so uh they were recording him giving the confession to us at the time and so it was i mean it just all unfolded in a matter of hours after being there so um it it started a process and it all did come to fruition and he did make the confession um and after making the confession uh was quite arrogant <laughs> um, and went to trial and pled self-defense that she had attacked him and the jury was out very very briefly and um, gave him 27 years to life, something like that. I'm not sure what the uh, exact sentence was, but uh, they they found him guilty in a fast hurry. Wow, you did such a great job on that. I mean, yeah. like we need to tell you that, but you know, that's <laughs> obvious. But wow, it really was from an interrogation uh, point of view. Man, that was really good. It really yeah, was when surprising. I when I taught, I'd always say the best interrogation is when the guy has no idea he's being interrogated. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and great. guys, try, try to imagine having an entire film crew, a, a, a whole ton of lights, yeah. and, the, and the entire suspect's family sitting there watching you do it. I don't think I'd be able to do it. Yeah, that'd be tough, man. <laughs> nice that'd job. be tough. Very nice job. Yeah, yeah great job. Yeah, it's, um, job. it's a different situation, and it's really different when you're on stage and there's 275 people in the audience, Yeah, plus all your crew and everybody there. And uh, But it's, um, I, I think I think we've been able to do some good things across time, and uh, I've 
I've been at this for a long, long time. It is fascinating to me. I learn something every single time I watch you guys uh, take apart uh, these interviews and, and do the clinics and the workshops that you have. And I don't care if people are in interrogation for a living, if they're in the, the work or study of this or not, uh, people should absolutely uh, take those those classes and workshops because I think it prepares you for everything you do in life. I think it prepares you in the job market. I think it prepares you in raising your children. I think it prepares you in not getting the wool pulled over your eyes and getting con. It prepares you to fight off the Bernie Madoffs. It prepares you for every aspect of your life. And I think you guys are absolutely the highest and best use of the internet. Thank, thank you very you so much. much. Uh, thank, thank you, thank you for being. We really appreciate that. I really, I really do. I think it's great, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan, and very flattered that you had me on today. Well, thank you. You're not as flattered as we are that you showed yeah, up. For sure. <laughs> Trust great me. To have you here? Yeah, we'd we love to have you thank, anytime. Anytime you see something yeah. you want to come back for, we'd love to have you. Yeah. yeah well, thank um, you so much. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so I, much. I'd love to do it again, and. Um, and uh, I need to have you guys on uh, my podcast and show again. We're going to crank back up in uh, uh, August, and hopefully we're going to have audiences and guests and everything like we oh, did pre-pandemic. So uh, hopefully we can we can work together in the future because I, I think our audience is absolutely fascinated by you guys and the science you bring to the table. Well, thank you. We'll, we'll be so there. Much. All you got to yeah. do is just give us the, the, the let oh, us know, and we'll show up. I'm, I'm holding you to that. Oh, we'll, we'll be, be there. there. I promise you. We'll be there. You. We'll be there. We'll be there and quick. All right, fellas. Well, Dr. Phil, thanks for joining us and being with us. We really do appreciate it. I think this was another good one. If you want to subscribe, please subscribe. Down there on the bottom, you'll see a little uh, little red thing that says subscribe. Hit that the little red bell and uh, become a panelist with us. You'll and, be joining uh, me if you hit the subscribe button because I certainly have. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. All right. I'll see you guys next time. Next time. Deal. Bye thanks. now. He knew I knew, I knew, he knew I knew, and he knew I knew, he knew I knew <laughs> uh, at that point. Uh,